the yoga of the spirit's freedom and greatness. And we're coming to the end now of Canto V and of Book I, the Book of Beginnings. So King Asvapati has undergone two transformations already. The first transformation of his soul and body at the end of Canto III, and then earlier on in Canto V, because of his intense aspiration to find a power that can bring about a divine life here on earth. And Shobindo describes him where his aspiration is so intense, he takes off like a rocket. You know? Huta has made a painting also. So in response to that intense aspiration, there is a descent and a transformation of his being. And he becomes able he becomes able to perceive the subtle worlds, the borderline of the subtle worlds. And last week we read, I think it's my favorite passage, or I can't say that, but one of my favorite passages in the whole of Savitri about how he saw like a ladder of worlds ascending and descending between the extremes, the poles of life. It's like a golden ladder carrying the soul from one end of existence to the other. An organ scale of the eternal's acts mounting to their climax in an endless calm faces of the many visaged wonderful, predestined stadia of the evolving way, measures of the stature of the growing soul. They interpreted existence to itself and mediating twixt the heights and deeps, united the veiled married opposites and linked creation to the ineffable. A last high world was seen where all worlds meet. In its summit gleam where night is not, nor sleep, the light began of the Trinity Supreme. All there discovered what it seeks for here. It freed the finite into boundlessness and rose into its own eternities. The inconscient found its heart of consciousness. The idea and feeling groping in ignorance at last clutched passionately the body of truth. The music born in matter silences, plucked nude out of the ineffable's fathomlessness, the meaning it had held but could not voice. The perfect rhythm, now only sometimes dreamed, an answer brought to the torn earth's hungry need, rending the night that had concealed the unknown 
giving to her her lost, forgotten soul a grand solution closed the long ambus in which the heights of mortal effort end. A reconciling wisdom looked on life. It took the striving undertones of mind and took the confused refrain of human hopes and made of them a sweet and happy call. It lifted from an underground of pain the inarticulate murmur of our lives and found for it a sense illimitable A mighty oneness, its perpetual theme. It caught the soul's faint scattered utterances, read hardly twixt our lines of rigid thought, or mid the drowse and coma on matter's breast, heard like disjointed mutterings in sleep. It grouped the golden links that they had lost and showed to them their divine unity, saving from the error of divided self the deep spiritual cry in all that is. The rungs of this golden ladder which Aswapati is seeing, which rises from the very deeps of matter up to the highest levels of consciousness, each of these rungs is like a world, is a world, is a plane of existence. Hmm? And here he's saying that these planes of existence it's like somebody playing on a powerful organ. An organ is the most powerful kind of musical instrument. No? It has many pipes. You, the, the, the musician has to play it with his hands and with his feet, and he pulls out the stops so that he can get the sounds of all different instruments. So when a good organist plays a powerful scale from the bottom to the top and from the top to the bottom. It is like that, something so thrilling and powerful. Hmm? Mother, played organ. Mother played a little organ. She didn't have a, one of those big organs that we get in, uh, in cathedrals, in big churches, in big concert halls. And. Um, that's why she was happy when somebody gave to Sunilda uh, an electric organ, a, a synthesizer. No? But even then he wasn't satisfied. No? <laughs> he, he expressed so much with his music. But this, we have to imagine it. This is something so powerful. No? So 
they, they, the, the musician who's playing this organ scale is starting at the bottom with the deep notes. Hmm? And it's rising up to a climax, to the highest, loudest, strongest point, and that is in an endless calm. It ends in perfect calm. Each of these rungs, these worlds, these planes of existence is a face, a face of the many-visaged wonderful, the one supreme. He has so many different faces. Each of them is a face expressing one aspect of him. They are also predestined stadia of the evolving way. Stadia, it's a, it was a, a measurement on the Roman roads. They, uh, every, every sort of fixed distance, there would be a kind of milepost, and there'd be a place where you, the messengers could change their horses. So it was, those roads went all over Europe, all over the Roman Empire, and it was a fixed destin, uh, length. So, on your journey, if you're traveling from Scotland, from Hadrian's Wall to Rome, you could count the stadia. So it's the same for our soul in its progress. We start at a certain level, and then there's a one milestone, and another, and another. Each of these planes of existence, it says, these are predestined stadia, they're fixed, hmm? mm -hmm. and they are measures of the stature of the growing soul. So the soul on its journey grows and progresses and develops, and each stadia represents a new stage. Hmm? So these planes of existence, these interpret existence, to itself. As the soul grows up the ladder, it can understand more and more what is this immense existence we are part of. Hmm? And they, these, these um, rungs, they mediate, they come in between and connect um, creation, no, they connect the heights, and the deeps, and they unite, they connect the veiled married opposites. Perhaps we can say spirit and nature, soul and matter. Hmm? But what is the veil exactly? Is it these, these, um, yes, it's a, it's a palm, yes. Um, this veil comes between the heights and the deeps. The deeps can't clearly see the heights, and the heights, yeah, maybe the heights can clearly see the deeps. No? Yeah. But on the way, uh, each step is veiled from us in a way until we reach that milestone. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they link creation, this manifestation that we are all part of, to the ineffable, the reality which can't be expressed, which can't be put into words or described. Mm -hmm. So there they are, all these different levels and we are going to see, quite in a few pages, we come to book two, the book of the Traveler of the Worlds. Now Aswapati is just seeing this ladder of worlds. In book two, he will start from the bottom, from the world of matter, and he will climb up and up and up and up and up and up to the top of the universe. Yeah. 
A pace, it's a step. Because of Visar, we say the face. There's a face and there's a pace. Pace is one step. Face, one. Yes, he says each of these worlds is like a face, an expression, but each of them is also a step upwards. Yeah? Alice. A last high world was seen where all worlds meet. In its sunlit gleam, where night is not nor sleep. The light began of the Trinity Supreme. All there discovered what it seeks. Here. Two more lines. Mm -hmm. Two more lines, please. It, it freed the finite into boundlessness and rose into its own eternities. Hmm. So this last high world, nowadays we can give it a name. We can say that this is the supramental world. Here, Sri Aurobindo is just describing it. It's the last high world, almost at the top of the ladder. And it's where all the worlds meet, all the planes connect there. There's a special light there at the top of the ladder. A summit gleam. Summit is the top. There's a special light there. In that light, there's no night. And there's no sleep. There's no unconsciousness. Hmm? There, the light begins. The light of the Trinity Supreme. Sat Ananda. Sat Sat, Chit, Ananda. Yes, they are worlds, yeah. Mm, yeah. levels. Mm. It's, it's a place of pure light. Mm. Yeah. No night, no shadow, no sleep, no unconsciousness. But above it, there's the higher light, the light of Sat, Chit, Ananda. So we say sat, pure existence, chit, consciousness and force, ananda, bliss. But we can only think of these as three things. Hmm? But there they are one thing, one complete thing, pure existence, full of consciousness and force full of bliss. So the top of the supramental connects with Satchitananda. We read in Life Divine, Sri Aurobindo explains the connection between them. In that last high world where all the world meets, everything discovered there, Asvapati sees that in that last high world, everything that is seeking here in our world discovers what it's seeking for. They all find what they are looking for. Hmm. That last high world sets free the finite, this limited, determined world manifestation that we live in, which is full of uh, boundaries and limits, no? It sets it free into boundlessness. So there's a borderline and that supramental, it sets everything free into eternity and infinity. 
and it itself goes on rising and rising and rising into its own eternities. Eternity is only one thing, then eternity is growing. No, there's one, there's lots and lots of eternities. <laughs> Everything finds its own eternity, its own infinity. Of course, they're all communicating and connected with each other, they're not separated. You like to try and read, George? <clears throat> and rolls uh, into its own eternities. The unconscious found its heart of consciousness. The idea and feeling groping uh, uh, in ignorance. At last, clashed passionately the body of truth. The music born in master silences, plucked made out of the infable's phantomlessness. The meaning it had held, had... Yes, correct. It had the meaning, it had held. Um, had could not voice. The perfect rhythm now only sometimes dreams. An answer brought to the torrent earth's hungry need. Uh, bending the night that had concealed the other Even to her, her lost, forgotten soul. Thank you. We'll pause there. This is developing the idea that of everything finding its fullness there. The inconscient, it's the lowest level of existence, that apparent inconscience. In contact with that last high world, it finds its heart of consciousness, the consciousness that is, it's holding within it and which it has been releasing. Mm -hmm. On our level, the idea and feeling that's groping in ignorance. Groping is when you can't see where you're going and you have to feel your way around. You know? That's what we are doing. We, we can't see clearly where we are going, we're trying to find what we are longing for, what the, the truth, the best. Hmm? There, that idea and feeling that's groping here in the ignorance, at last is able to passionately embrace the body of truth. It can find it in that whatever it's been looking for in that last high world. Sri says here, and he says it in other places too, that in matter, to us matter seems to not express anything. No, it has no voice, it's dumb, it's inconscient, it's inert. But Sri says there's a kind of music there. There are voices wanting to express something, only they can't. You know? So that music that's been born in the silences of matter, there in that world, it's able to just get hold of what it wants, you know? plucked, nude, without any covering, out of the ineffable fathomlessness that something that's fathomless, it is so deep, we can't ever find the bottom of it. No? So the ineffable is like that, the inexpressible, the supreme. Mm? That music can find the meaning that it had held within it. It's been carrying a meaning within it that it wanted to express but it couldn't voice it, it couldn't, it couldn't make us hear that music. But there in that world, it finds its music. We may dream, perhaps, 
of a perfect rhythm that keeps everything in harmony. There, that rhythm can be heard. And it brings an answer to the need, the need of our earth, which suffers so much. The torn earth's hungry need. Because that rhythm, when it is heard, it's as if it tears apart the night that has concealed the unknown truth. And that rhythm gives back to the earth her lost, forgotten soul. That soul that's been trying to express itself, that was closed up in the inconscient. That rhythm, that music, uh, gives back to the earth what she's been looking for. Mina. So, thank you. So, on those, in that last high world, a grand solution is found. An ampas is a, a street that is closed, and there's no way through. No? And an ampas is when you reach a barrier that you can't cross. Yeah? Blamed in, hmm? blamed in, blamed in. What do we call it? Dead end. Dead end. A dead end. Dead end. Dead end. And the, the sign says no through road. No, you can't pass through. But that feeling of being, of having reached an ampas, of having reached something where you can't go through, hmm? suddenly that is solved. Hmm? There's a solution there. That ampas is, uh, is what we feel with all our mortal efforts. Our hum we are human beings, subject to ignorance and death. We are mortal. So whatever we try to do, we may have some measure of success, but finally we reach that ampas. But now it closes it with a solution. It changes it completely. It's uh, transformed. It is a conclusion, a solution, but it's not a frustrating barrier. It's a satisfying solution. In that world and from that world, a reconciling wisdom looks on life. That's what Sri Aurobindo gives us always, a wisdom that looks at things that we think are contradictory and opposites, and he reconciles them. He shows that they are necessary to each other and uh, can be harmonized. No? So a wisdom that sees like that, looks on life. And it takes the striving undertones of mind. Undertones is also a word for music. When we sing, there are some people who can do, and not just singing a particular note, but they can also uh, sing a whole range of undertones and another whole range 
of overtones. There are some people here in Oroville who can do that. And they come here to the Sangam Hall and they practice. And you just can't imagine that out of a human mouth these sounds are coming. <laughs> Undertones. What is there underneath? All the possibilities underneath. And overtones. The ones that are above. No? So mind. Mind is a level, a plane of existence. A very important one for us. But it has these undertones, deep possibilities that we are usually not aware of them. Striving undertones of mind. We're trying to understand and grasp things, but we can't do it. It takes those striving undertones. And it all at the same time, it takes the confused refrain of human hopes. A song that has a, f a line at the end which gets repeated over and over again. We call it the refrain, the chorus, the refrain. So with our human hopes, um, there's always repeated some particular uh, element. It gets repeated. And we are, because we are confused, we can't get this into a harmony. No? But that reconciling wisdom takes the confused uh, refrains and it takes the striving undertones and it lifts them, makes them into a sweet and happy call. Like the, the bird song in the early morning. And it lifts up from this uh, underground, this basis of pain that's always there in our lives. And the, he says, the inarticulate murmur of our lives. Our lives are always trying to say something, to say something meaningful, but we are inarticulate, we can't express it. Somebody who's inarticulate, they have something to say, but they can't put it into words so that we can understand it. So our lives are like that. We're all carrying a message, but we can't get it out. So, <laughs> so that gets lifted up and it is given a sense, a meaning, an illimitable meaning, immensely rich and powerful, infinite meaning. Lela. And mighty oneness is perpetual thing. It called the soul's faint scattered utterances. Let the heart repeat our lines of the rigid thought. Only this draws and come coma. and coma on Matthias' breast. Heard like his jointed muttering in sleep. It blew the golden wings that they had lost and showed to them the divine unity. Sailing from their undivided self, the deep spiritual cry in all the deeds. Yes. So this solution, no? It's perpetual th theme, it's unchanging topic, meaning is oneness, a mighty oneness, a huge oneness. And one of the things it does is to catch the faint, scattered utterances of the soul. Our soul is deep within, it can't speak very, or it, it speaks clearly, but we don't hear it. What we hear 
are faint messages, here and there, scattered utterances that the soul is telling us. But we hear them faintly and we hear them scattered. We can't make sense of them. We can hardly make sense. We can hardly read them between our lines of rigid thought. There's an expression, reading between the lines. You know, somebody writes or says something and you're supposed to understand something more that is not said. So the soul is like that. We can't hear. We, we've got our lines of rigid thought. That's, uh, we, that prevents us from hearing uh, what, what, the soul, what else the soul is saying. You know? But it, this uh, solution, this rhythm, can catch those faint, scattered utterances uh, that um, we can hardly read through the lines of our rigid thought and that we can only hear very faintly because here we are in this drowse and coma on matter's breast. A coma is when you're unconscious. I mean, no, a coma is when your consciousness can't express itself. Hmm? People go into a coma, actually if they wake up, they can tell you exactly what they were conscious of. But when they're in the coma, they can't express anything. And then we think, oh, they're dead or they're uh, finished now. No. Or in, in a deep drowse, in sleep, we can't express itself or we can't hear properly. Hmm? If somebody's comatose, they're in a state of coma. They can't hear and they can't speak. No? But when you come back from the coma, you remember. You may. It, it, I, I, I just remember 21 days in the coma, my accident. And I remember yes. days. Yes, so that can happen sometimes. It doesn't always happen. But more and more now they are... Um, finding ways for people to recover that lost memories, yeah. awareness. Yeah. So that's what happens here. This grand solution um, catches hold of those disjointed utterance mutterings that we couldn't hear in our coma or in our sleep. And it c connects together all the golden links, the golden connections that they had lost. They couldn't make sense because the utterances are scattered. They couldn't see the connections. But when that solution comes, then it shows to them their divine unity, the way they are all connected. And that solution saves from the error of divided self, the deep spiritual cry in all that is. That's our error. We are convinced that we're all separate and everything separate. And it's very difficult for us to change our awareness and realize the oneness that connects everything. The deep spiritual cry in all that is. It's very fantastic life. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Yes. That's what we need. We need to be saved from the error of divided self. And that's what Shobindo is always trying to do for us. Mother. to give us the experience of who we really are and how we're connected to everything else that really is. Suresh. All the great words that I will express 
among the greater into an absolute of it. Never burning revolutions were and the immortality of the eternal voice. Yes. All the great words, it means all the great teachings and rev uh, revelations that have been expressed in different times and by different uh, great souls. Those great words that made an effort to express that oneness. There on that last highest world, all, they're all lifted up into an absoluteness of light, an ever-burning revelations fire where the truth, the deep truth that's in all of them, which they were trying to express, gets revealed, gets shown clearly. And uh, reveals the immortality of the eternal voice, the voice that gives those words and those messages. I think we'll stop there for today. An organ scale of the eternal's acts mounting to their climax in an endless calm basis of the many visaged wonderful Predestined stadia of the evolving way, measures of the stature of the growing soul. They interpreted existence to itself and mediating twixt the heights and deeps united the veiled married opposites and linked creation to the ineffable. A last high world was seen where all worlds meet. In its summit gleam where night is not, nor sleep, the light began of the Trinity Supreme. All there discovered what it seeks for here. It freed the finite into boundlessness and rose into its own eternities. The inconscient found its heart of consciousness, the idea and feeling groping in ignorance, at last clutched passionately the body of truth. The music born in matter's silences, plucked nude out of the ineffable's fathomlessness, the meaning it had held but could not voice. The perfect rhythm now only sometimes dreamed, an answer brought to the torn earth's hungry need, rending the night that had concealed the unknown, giving to her her lost, forgotten soul. A grand solution closed the long impasse in which the heights of mortal effort end. A reconciling wisdom looked on life. It took 
the striving undertones of mind and took the confused refrain of human hopes and made of them a sweet and happy call. It lifted from an underground of pain the inarticulate murmur of our lives and found for it a sense illimitable, a mighty oneness, its perpetual theme. It caught the soul's faint, scattered utterances, read hardly twixt our lines of rigid thought, or mid this drowse and coma on matter's breast, heard like disjointed mutterings in sleep. It grouped the golden links that they had lost, and showed to them their divine unity. Saving from the error of divided self, the deep spiritual cry in all that is. All the great words that toiled to express the one were lifted into an absoluteness of light an ever-burning revelation's fire and the immortality of the eternal voice.